All right, we will begin by reading from 2 Corinthians 13. Read the first uh, seven verses. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that, that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank thee so much for thy servant John Calvin and for the tremendous impact he has had upon the Reformed faith so dear to us, so synonymous with his name, but also the tremendous impact he's had on so many preachers throughout the ages. And as we study his style of preaching, his content, his manner of delivery, his experiential emphases, his uh, tie-in with assurance of faith. May it benefit us tremendously and may it impact our own ministries as well. So be with us today and graciously bless this lecture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, today we look at John Kelvin. And there's a lot to say about Calvin, so I envision this will take the whole lecture. Calvin was uh, one of the most notable reformers. I won't say that he's more notable than people like Henry Bollinger or Peter Martyr, even though today we think of him as being the lead reformer. That was not the case in his own day. But Calvin embraced a high view of preaching. He called the preaching office, quote, the most excellent of all things. And he held it in the highest esteem. He said, there's nothing more notable or glorious in the church than the ministry of the gospel. In his commentary on Isaiah 55, 11, he writes, the word goeth out of the mouth of God in such a manner that it likewise goeth out of the mouth of men. For God does not speak openly from heaven, but employs men as his instruments. So understanding Calvin's view, the way God speaks to us today is through ministers expounding the word faithfully. And as long as they are expounding it faithfully, we have to treat it as the very voice of God. And that's just a staggering thought. In fact, Calvin viewed preaching as God's ordinary means of salvation and benediction. He actually taught that there are two ministers in every sermon. He calls the, the man who stands behind the pulpit, which uh, hopefully one day will be you, the external minister. And the Holy Spirit is the internal minister. And so the internal minister uses the external minister to bring the word of God home to the heart. He writes, The external minister holds forth the vocal word and it is received by the ears, but the internal minister truly communicates the thing proclaimed, which is Christ. Wherever the gospel is preached, Calvin writes, it is as if God himself came into the midst of us. There is an inward efficacy of the Holy Spirit, which he sheds forth 
when he sets forth his power upon hearers, that they may embrace a discourse, we would call it a sermon, by faith. So this is through the illuminating, converting, and sealing of sinners, which is the domain of the Holy Spirit, that he takes this word and applies it. And so in Calvin's mind, and this is, uh, I think, part of the power of the Reformation, the preached word and the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit can be distinguished, <clears throat> but they can be separated. <coughs> because when the Spirit, or rather, when the Word is being preached faithfully, the Spirit organically is there. He's in it. Word and Spirit are joined together organically. Without the Spirit, hearing the preached Word would only add to the condemnation of unbelievers. But it's His normal way to use His Word. So, Calvin, therefore, admonished those who emphasized the Holy Spirit apart from the Word, or at the expense of the Word, calling it satanic. Because he said, only Satan separates the Spirit from the Word. Now, this stress on preaching, this tremendous stress on preaching, moved Calvin to be active on several fronts in Geneva. First, he showed his conviction through his own example. Calvin preached from the New Testament on Sunday mornings, the Psalms on Sunday afternoon, and the Old Testament usually at 6 a.m. on one or two weekdays. Following that schedule in Geneva from 1541 to 1564, he averaged 170 sermons a year. When it came to his deathbed, he got the town council around him, his fellow preachers, and so on. And um, you, you, you know the story well, that he asked for uh, forgiveness for the irascibility of his temper. Um, he did lose his temper from time to time. I suppose you would too if you were working 20 hours a day for a couple decades. And... Uh, involved at the center of the Reformation, people coming to you for everything, you're overwhelmed. But um, he asked for forgiveness, received their forgiveness, and then he said to them something like this, I don't have the exact words, but he said, the most significant thing I've ever done in my life is preaching. Not my writings, my preaching. That gives you an insight into the mind of Kelvin. Second thing I want to say by way of introduction about Kelvin and his emphasis on preaching is that unlike almost any other preacher in church history, Kelvin preached a lot, a lot to his people about how they should listen to sermons and respond to sermons. Um, this tremendously impressed me. One year I spent quite a bit of time reading Calvin's sermons on Deuteronomy in the old facsimile print, which was a joy to read. And uh, what I found, the, I mean the most memorable thing for me that I found in those sermons was he's constantly going back to them and telling them how to listen to a sermon and how to use a sermon. Um, it struck me because about a year or two before that I was actually uh, called upon to deliver a, an address at a conference in Mississippi on how should people listen to sermons. And at that time, maybe 15 years ago now, I could only find one source on it. It was a 19th century book by Edward Bickersteth. Here you've got thousands of books written on how to preach and almost nothing on how to listen. Now, meanwhile, there's been a couple things written. Um, and... Um, there's a manuscript we received recently. Uh, we st still in the. We haven't decided whether to publish it or not yet. I believe. Um, 
of about 150 pages on how to listen to sermons. So it's finally being addressed. But Calvin, you know, I didn't, I didn't discover that when I prepared my address, that, you know, embedded in his commentary on Deuteronomy are all these references. But it's everywhere. And uh, he's, he's, he's teaching them that unscriptural sermons are to be rejected. Scriptural sermons are not just to be accepted and received and meditated on, but Calvin says they're to be obeyed. They're to be obeyed. They're to be done, sort of like what we heard in chapel this morning. And Calvin's goal is that people would, through his admonitions and through his emphasis on teaching them how to listen, that they would grasp the importance of preaching. Then learn to desire preaching as their supreme blessing. And then learn to participate, and this is what Calvin says, and it's like, this is very idealistic. Learn to participate as actively in the sermon as the preacher himself. That's amazing. And that takes great grace. As a preacher, you sit and listen to another preacher, and you get very involved, and, and I, I, just, I just love to hear good preaching. But to say that I am as actively involved as when I'm up there myself? <laughs> wow. You've got to really be drinking in the Word to be able to say that. And it's got to be resonating, echoing in your soul to be able to say that. Uh, so that's, that's quite a statement. And then Calvin says elsewhere in Deuteronomy, this statement, which, which struck me too, that our basic attitude in, in, in hearing a sermon should be an attitude of one of willingness, quote, willingness to obey God completely and with no reserve, end quote. Willingness to obey God completely and with no reserve. Now think about that. Today, when we listen to a sermon, we think we're going with an attitude of obedience, and perhaps we are. But if we hear something uncomfortable, what, ha what pops up in our mind? Some reservation. We look for some way to, to wiggle out of that uncomfortable statement. Uh, too often. But I think what the Reformers and the Puritans had that's so missing today is that they were really, really open and vulnerable to reshaping their lives according to what they heard from the pulpit. The pulpit really changed their lives. By the Holy Spirit, yes, but the Holy Spirit cultivated in their mind an attitude of obedience to what the Word was going to be. Now, that's the ideal. What about the real? Well, one reason Calvin emphasized listening so much is because in his day, too, there was a huge problem. There were a lot of people that were just nominal professors. Um, and maybe more so in Calvin's day than our day because... People that come to church today either want to be there or they're there for some other reasons, but they're not required to be there. But in Geneva, you were required to go to church. So imagine what our church would be like if everybody in Grand Rapids had to cram in our church building. Even people that didn't want to be there. There'd be a lot of bad listeners, right? So that's what Calvin was confronted with. And um, when I studied this subject some years ago in relationship to my doctoral dissertation, uh, I got sidetracked for a while studying Calvin on preaching. Um, and I started noticing all these statements where Calvin was talking about how few people really listened well. And I counted 40 comments along these lines in his sermons on Deuteronomy, his commentaries, particularly Psalm 119, and the Institutes section from 321 to 324, I counted 40 comments along this line. I just quote one of them. 
This is Institutes 3.24.12. If the same sermon is preached, say to a hundred people, 20 receive it with a ready obedience of faith, while the rest hold it valueless, or laugh, or hiss, or loathe it. Wow. Next time you're feeling sorry for yourself that your sermons aren't accepted by everyone, go back and read Calvin. 80%, he's saying, hold my sermon valueless, or laugh at it, or hiss it, or loathe it. Well, if profitable hearing was a problem in Calvin's day, imagine what it is in our day when ministers have to compete for the congregation's attention with the mass media that bombards us from all sides. And where in most churches people can sit with their cell phones and be texting and other things right during the sermon. Thirdly, Calvin saw to it that the whole Genevan system established, uh, that he established, emphasized preaching. Over the years, Calvin kept building up preaching in Geneva until it reached its apex when the Genevan ordinances stipulated that on Sundays sermons were to be preached in each of the three churches at daybreak and a second sermon at 9 a.m. So by 10.30 a.m. you could already have two sermons under your belt if you were a devout layman. And then after the children were catechized at noon, a third sermon was preached in each church at 3 p.m. Weekday sermons were also scheduled in all three churches on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And get this, at varying hours. So if you wanted to take in more than one, you could walk over to the next church and take in two or three in one night. Imagine if you asked your people to uh, consider going to two or three sermons on a Wednesday night. You see, by the time Calvin died, and this is, it's, it's hard to believe this, but at least one sermon was preached in every church in Geneva every day of the week. Now this is phenomenal. You understand the influence of Calvin and the spirit working, no doubt, but the stress on preaching. Calvin believed in preaching. And so did the pastors with him. So Calvin's gifts and his very high view of preaching in these three thoughts I just gave you, uh, both theologically and in practice, ought to motivate us as we study his sermons. So what I want to do in this lecture is I want to give you a broad overview of how he preached and then focus more narrowly on the question of how he preached experientially. And I want to look at how that experiential preaching interfaced with um, three doctrines, assurance of faith, election, and self-examination. So first then, let's have some general comments about Calvin's preaching, because being such an important figure, that's, that's fascinating to, to observe. First of all, Calvin preached uh, expositionally, or serially, from various books of the Bible. And his preaching style was quite simple. He would simply strive to show the meaning of a passage and then how it should impact the lives of his hearers. Much of his preaching, most of his preaching, was like the ancient church homilies in style. The sermons had no divisions or points other than what the text uh, dictated from time to time. Paul Fuhrman writes, they are properly homilies, as in the ancient church, expositions of Bible passages in the light of grammar and history, then providing application to the hearer's life situations. Well, Calvin was a careful expositor and a faithful applier of the word. His goals in preaching were to glorify God, to cause believers to grow in grace, and to unite sinners with Christ. 
And this aim of saving sinners through preaching, in Calvin's mind, blended seamlessly with his emphasis on scriptural doctrines. From time to time, Calvin brings contemporary events into his sermons, but, but not very often. Um, when he does so, he also uses those events in a practical, experiential, and, and moral way. One of the most fascinating sermons Calvin ever preached was when he came back to Geneva after he was kicked out. You know, he was from... Um, 1536 to 1538 in Geneva the first time was kicked out Roman Catholics tried to take over the town again gave him a call invited him back he didn't want to leave Strasbourg he said he'd rather go anywhere in the world than go back into the cesspool of, of Geneva and yet God compelled him again and made him willing and he went back and uh, when he came back of course it was a sort of victory for Calvin, in a way, a vindication. And the church was packed the first Sunday. Everybody wanted to hear what he would say. And they thought he would vindicate himself in some way. And Calvin gets up and he says, well, we left off three years ago. Ezekiel 11. We'll now take the second part of Ezekiel 11. Never says a word about it. Just went right on with this series as if he'd never been gone for three years. Never been rejected. Didn't say a word of evil. But, you know, the people that called their dogs by, by his name and uh, stoned his house and did all kinds of horrible things. and Nothing. Just went right on with the word of God. So what an example of the supremacy of the word. Now, the image of the preacher as a teacher... Preacher as a teacher, move Calvin to emphasize the importance of careful sermon preparation. Calvin's always teaching in his preaching, even in his applications. He's always making statements like this. Now let us learn from this, and then he says it. Or let us observe from this. He's always saying, let us, let us, let us. He's taking you across the bridge from the exposition into your daily life through teaching. How he accomplished that goal himself of careful sermon preparation with his frequency of preaching and his heavy additional workload really remains a mystery to today. I've never read anyone that can explain how Calvin prepared so thoroughly. It, it's obvious he read books uh, on, on, the, on the text he was going to preach. He was well read. He didn't use notes hardly at all, if at all. Preached extemporaneously. So we do, know, we do know this, that he had an incredibly remarkable memory. He must have been able to read different books and then got in his mind what he wanted to say and just could say it without having to resort to notes. and Could say it so well. He was such a master of language and the beauty of language that it was as if it was written out in final form. There's not many men that have that gift. I know only a few in the world today. But um, my dear friend Sinclair Ferguson, I think, being one of them. But this man had this unusual gift where he could stand and preach for 40 minutes and scribe Dennis R, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, I just call him Dennis R, took notes, shorthand. If Dennis wasn't there, we wouldn't have the 2,000 plus sermons of Calvin that we have. For years, there are no sermon notes on Calvin's sermons because, well, the scribe was not there, the shorthand scribe. So we owe a, a, a large debt to, uh, to, to the, uh, the shorthand brother who took down these notes. Calvin never, never intended any of his sermons to be published. But this, this brother took down what he said. And as you read it, I mean, it reads, it reads almost as well as the uh, Institutes. Uh, this is amazing. So there's unusual gift here. 
The average length of the text that Calvin covered in his sermons was usually four or five verses in the Old Testament and two or three in the New. His sermons tended to be on the shorter end in his day. Most scholars say purposely so because he had an asthmatic condition. That's not absolutely proven, but they did tend to be 35 to 40 minutes long, which was considered uh, rather short. But Calvin himself um, thought but both his sermons and his writings were studies in brevity. He really believed in brevity. And we look at his commentaries today <laughs> and we say, brevity? You look at his institutes and you say, brevity? But you look at Peter Martyr's institutes and you say, yes, Calvin, you were brief. You look at Martin Bootser's commentaries, they ramble on and on and on, and you say, yes, Calvin, you are brief. Interestingly, who gets reprinted today? Bootser? There's all kinds of stuff that could be translated, printed, but it's too wordy. Peter Martyr? Uh, beginning to revive some of the stuff. His institutes are still languishing. Under glass, upstairs. Um, very rare book, but never been redone. Probably because it's, it's a bit wordy. Should it be done? Oh, yes, of course it should be done. But what I'm saying to you is interesting. Things that are too long-winded, too wordy, tend not to survive the generations. Even in centuries past, much less today. Um, Calvin said, we must shun all unprofitable babbling and stay ourselves upon plain teaching, which is forcible. Now, in statements like that, if you've been reading the Puritans and you understand the Puritan style of preaching, you can see that the influence of Calvin on the Puritans. Plain preaching. Rhetoric for its own sake, said Calvin, must always be avoided. Though true eloquence, when subjected to the simplicity of the gospel, is to be coveted. Joachim Westfall once charged Calvin with babbling in his sermons. That's the word, babbling. Calvin replied that he stuck to the main point of the text and practiced, quote, cautious brevity. So obviously Calvin defended himself here, did not agree with Westfall. The most striking thing about Calvin's sermons are his applications. They just, they're everywhere. In some cases, application consumes more time than exposition. But particularly you find in his sermons short, pungent applications. Constantly urging sinners to uh, believe in Christ, act in obedience to God's word. Calvin said, we do not come to preaching merely to hear what we do not know, but to be incited to do our duty. Now, T.H. Th. L. Parker, who's one of the best um, Calvin scholars, of at least of Calvin's commentaries and of his preaching, wrote a whole book on it, said that most of Calvin's sermons follow a certain pattern. Number one, begins with prayer. Number two, a quick recapitulation of the previous sermon. Dear congregation, last week we saw dot, dot, dot. One, two paragraphs. Then point 3a, exegesis and exposition of the first point. 3b, application of the first point and exhortation to obey or to do your duty with regard to that point. 
for A, exegesis and exposition of the second point, and for B, application of the second point, exhortation to obedience of duty. And then maybe in some sermons there would be a 5A and a 5B and a 6A and a 6B, but if Calvin gets through two, three major points with major sets of applications, the sermons aren't long. And then he says, basically, my time is up and we'll continue here where we left off next time. And then he has point five, closing, uh, closing thought or two, and then a closing prayer. And in the prayer, Calvin gives you a brief, implicit, um, spontaneous summary of the sermon and what needs to be done and praying that the Holy Spirit will help people to do that. It's interesting that uh, the scribe also took down that closing prayer. Appears not to have taken down the opening prayer. I don't know why. But the closing prayers, uh, you know, uh, in his commentaries also where he puts them down, um, are just uh, amazing. In fact, you know, those prayers have been collected and published as a separate, separate book. There is a fair bit of repetition in those closing prayers. But, um, so if you read them, if you try to read 20 or 30 in a row, that's really not the way to do it. The way to do it is read one a day. And you'll find them, you'll find them edifying. All right. Um, any questions on Calvin's preaching as a whole? And uh, now I'm going to go into the piety and the experiential application. Yes? You mentioned that Calvin would start uh, explaining a text, and whenever his time would be up, he would just stop and continue the next yeah. uh, service. What do you think about that for today? I like it very much, but I've never seen anybody do it today. What do you think? No, I, I think today... I would not preach in the same style as Calvin. I mean, the homely style has its advantages because it, it does keep you bound to the word. But uh, in our society today, I think the hearer is a bit different. And it's a more memorable style if you can find one major theme and a few concrete subpoints that you can set out before people and then preach them and then wrap it up with some solid conclusions so people walk out with one major theme, one major thought, a well done. Now, you still can say at the end of your sermon today, I have no problem with that, you know, we'll, we'll continue with Mark 10 again next week, but, uh, and you still preach serially, but it's a better style today, uh, in my opinion, to, to have one theme and, point, and major points, and to say that up front, and then do it so the, the hearer is with you. Um, and personally, I think Calvin's sermons would have, would have improved. That was, sounds funny saying how could Calvin's sermons improve, but you know, no one's perfect. I think his sermons would have improved by, by a little more organization that way. It would be more powerful. All right, Calvin's stress on piety. Calvin understood true religion as fellowship between God and man. Part of the fellowship that moves from God to man, Calvin calls revelation. Revelation. And the part of the fellowship that moves from man to God, which involves, of course, our obedient response, Calvin calls pietas, or we would say piety. And that piety exercises itself by faith and always involves devout acts of faith. And Kelvin often says what they are. He uses different language, many different places, but I've summarized it this way. Childlike trust, humble adoration, godly fear, and undying love. 
And when you study Calvin's applications through the prism of these four aspects of piety, you'll notice that his applications are often aiming to excite these four graces. Trust, adoration, fear, and love. So for Kelvin, the goal of the preacher is to promote such piety while remaining acutely aware that, of course, the Holy Spirit alone can work that piety in the soul. But you see, again, for Kelvin, there's no tension here because the Holy Spirit has promised to use the preaching. So as you preach, the Holy Spirit will do what's designed to do, what preaching is designed to do. I had an old elder in my congregation who, before I would preach, would often, years ago, would often say something like this in his uh, pre-service prayer. Uh, Lord, as thy servant puts the arrow into the bow in the next few moments and shoots the arrow out at the congregation, the arrow of thy word, Holy Spirit, guide that arrow to strike every heart with the kind of medicine that that particular arrow needs to uh, exercise. And um, I think Calvin would say amen to that. I think that's what he's trying to do. And uh, recognizing that the minister shoots the arrow, but it's the Holy Spirit that guides it to the heart, sovereignly, graciously, doing in the soul what needs to be done. And when that is done by the Holy Spirit, you see, always the fruit of that is true piety. One time it may be more true piety, exercised a bit more by love, another time more by godly fear, whatever. But those things are all mixed, mixed together too. Piety, piety, piety for Calvin is the, the critical response to the hearing of the word of God. Well, the critical response to everything, also is theology. I've uh, told you before that in the first edition of the Institutes, the word piety is used in the subtitle twice. And in his introduction in the last edition of the Institutes, he actually says, the only reason, I wrote these Institutes, the only reason, I'm sure there were more, but it was so predominant that the others didn't, weren't worth mentioning, is to promote that I wrote these institutes is to promote piety in the people of God. So this is a huge factor in the life of Calvin. And of course, piety and experiential emphases are, are um, inseparable, as we've, we've seen already in this course. So where God's glory, where God's glory is not served, said Calvin, true piety cannot exist. So in this true piety that you're trying to stir up in people, you need to aim for two things. And here you go back to the beginning of the Institutes as well. You need to aim, up and stir, you need to aim for stirring up knowledge of God, right knowledge of God, and right knowledge of yourself. And when you get the right knowledge of yourself and God together, that will drive you to Jesus Christ. It will drive you to faith, to need the Savior, and it will stir up in you the fruits of sanctification and piety. So this double knowledge, says Calvin, compels, knowledge of God, knowledge of myself, compels discipline, obedience, and love in every sphere of the believer's life. And that kind of piety that's stirred up then is a piety that responds to all the precepts of God, all the commandments of God, both the first table of the law and the second table of the law. For Calvin, you see, true piety is not just vertical in my relationship with God, but also horizontal in my relationship of love and law to my neighbor. And so grace and law are interwoven and are prominent in Calvin's theology and preaching. Keeping the law as the rule of life is particularly important for Calvin because its supreme purpose is to lead us to consecrate our entire lives to God. 
Lionel Grieve says in his doctoral dissertation, grace has priority in such a way for Calvin's piety that it may be considered as a quality of life in response to God's grace that transcended law, but at the same time includes law. Calvin's piety, he goes on to say, may be termed transcendent piety. It transcends the creature because it's founded in grace, but yet it includes the creature as he is the subject of faithfulness. He's a subject in such a way that his piety is never primarily for his own welfare. The general movement of Calvin's piety is always Godward, and the benefits and God's goodness are merely byproducts of the main purpose, glorifying God. So what he's saying is, there's kind of a transcendent piety here where in true piety, my soul is lifted up to glorify God, but in the act of doing so, in that holy fear and that adoration and that godly love, that then impacts me horizontally so that I obey the law, love not only God above all, love my neighbors, myself, and really um, exercise piety horizontally as well. Now, it's this combined emphasis of God's glory and spirit-worked piety in my soul that lead Calvin to a theology of Christian experience. For Calvin, experience is a theological and spiritual necessity, which ought not surprise you since he emphasized the work of the Holy Spirit greatly and actually earned for himself thereby the nickname the theologian of the Holy Spirit. So Calvin just naturally has a pneumatological experiential emphasis of piety that spills over into his sermons. The question really, once you know, understand Calvin's way of thinking theologically, is not is Calvin an experiential preacher? The answer is so obvious to that that it doesn't even bear proving. It's not worth proving. The real question is, what role does experience, or as Calvin called it in Latin, experientia, what role does experientia play in his theology and in his preaching? Which leads me to my next point, Calvin and experience. Now, Calvin values experience, and this is, this, is, this is absolutely critical for Calvin. Calvin values experience as so long as it is rooted in Scripture. Number one, rooted in Scripture. And number two, so long as it springs out of the living reality of faith. Experience not grounded in Scripture is worth nothing. Experience not exercised by faith is worth nothing. And Calvin repeatedly, repeatedly talks about experience as something that is beyond verbal expression. He most famously does this with regard to the Lord's Supper. You probably know that when he talks about how God comes down in the Lord's Supper and there's communion. Then he lifts us back up to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And um, he admits it sounds mystical. And then when people ask him, well, how do you explain that? He says, I, I, you, just, you just can't put it into words. It's beyond words. Um, for example, he writes this. This is taken from Institutes 1.7.5. Such then is a conviction that requires no reason, such a knowledge with which the best reason agrees, in which the mind truly reposes more securely and constantly than in any reasons. Such, finally, a feeling that can only be born of heavenly revelation. I speak of nothing other than that which each believer experiences within himself. Though my words fall far beneath a just explanation of the matter. Now that's vintage, vintage Calvin. Now he goes on to say that the believer's recognition of God, however, consists more 
in living experience than in vain and high-flown speculations. Well, that's important. Because those feelings that are beyond words are not just floating out there in high, vain speculations, but they are grounded in the Word of God. And then he makes this statement, which I think cements it all together nicely. Indeed, with our experience as our teacher, we will find God to be just as he declares himself in his word. So if you find through your experience that the God you end up believing in is something different from the God of the word, it's false experience, according to Calvin. And Luther, of course, said it even stronger. He said, if you can't find your experience back in the Word, your experience is of the devil. So false experience fabricates a God that does not square with the Scriptures. But Holy Scripture is always consistent with sacred, spirit-worked experience. Now, Willem Balke, B-A-L-K-E, in his uh, article on Calvin, uh, in relationship to the word and experience, which is one of the best things written on this subject. Balky says, experience can serve as a hermeneutical key in the explanation of the scriptures. The Bible places us in the center of the struggle of faith, in Carm Dale, in the face of God. And therefore, Calvin can recommend himself as an exegete, as he does in the introduction to the commentary in the Psalms, since he has experienced what the Bible testifies. All right, so now you've got something very interesting happening. Calvin comes along and says at the beginning of the Psalms, I consider myself to be one qualified to write a commentary on the Psalms because I've experienced what David has experienced and the psalmists have experienced. So I find my experience back in these Psalms, and because I've experienced these things, don't only know them in my head, therefore, I'm a qualified exegete for this commentary. And it's interesting that it's particularly in this very experiential book of the Bible, the Psalms, that you find Calvin's most extended treatment in all his writings of his own conversion. Now, Calvin sees the Psalms, as, you, as you've, you've no doubt heard, as an anatomy of all parts of the soul. And so he sees the Psalms also in an experiential way. At the same time, Calvin is careful to underscore that experience has its limitations. When divorced from the Word, it becomes altogether unreliable and always incomplete. But also, Calvin concludes that nuda experientia, a naked experience, just experience all by itself. It's an expression he uses quite a bit, nuda experientia. Um, experience by itself. Though it may penetrate the depths of the soul, it can never reveal the way to God. And that's where Calvin parts ways with the mystic. Because the mystic believes that somehow through contemplation and experience, he can find the way to God. No, says Calvin, only through the word, only in Jesus Christ, only by faith. Word, Christ, faith. Those three things are absolutely indispensable. Now, if that is not the case, says Calvin, in other words, if Scripture is not the foundation of our experience of faith, all we'll be left with is vague feelings that have no anchor. We need an anchor for our experiences. They must be anchored, tethered to the Word of God. So Calvin, with all his emphasis on experience, is not an experientialist. <laughs> 
And that's why he f so seldom f calls attention to his own experiences. He avoids, on the one side, experientialism, and he avoids, on the other side, dry scholasticism. He doesn't see the Bible as a mere collection of doctrines, but he also doesn't see the Bible as a mere collection of experiences. But rather, biblical doctrines must be embedded embedded in the life and faith of the individual and of the church. And flow out of the natural habitat of the Word of God. So that they can be verified as genuine. Now that leads Calvin to distinguish between experientia fide and sensus fide. That is the experience of faith or the, ex the sense of faith. This too is inseparable for Calvin from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. A spirit renews the very core of man. And that work involves illumination and sealing. And the Spirit's sealing work certifies the authority of the Word and the reality of God's own saving work within the believer. And that promotes confidence in God's promises of mercy and experience of those promises. And this doctrine of the experientia fide, Calvin says, is a doctrine not of the tongue but of life. This is Institutes 364. It is not apprehended by the understanding and memory alone, as other disciplines are, but it is received only when it possesses the whole soul and finds a seat and resting place in the inmost affections of the heart. Talk about an experiential flavor. Say it again. This, this experience of fide, experience of faith, is not just an experience of the tongue, but of life. It's not apprehended by the understanding and memory alone, as other disciplines are, but it's received only when it possesses the whole soul, finds a seat and resting place in the inmost affection of the heart. So for Calvin, in true experience, there's always this objective truth and this subjective experience combined. The Spirit testifies both of the Word of God and to and within the heart of the believer. And the believer receives that testimony and experiences the reality of that testimony. And then the heart and the will and the emotions all respond in faith, in obedience to the Word of God, so that the whole man, says Calvin, finds experiential rest in Christ in the inmost affections of his heart. So this is Calvin's way of saying that true experience, true fellowship with the Father and the Son by the Spirit, is in John's language, True experience always leads to true communion with God and then to true praxis pietatis, that is, true practice of piety. By their fruits you shall know them. Now, this is exactly where Calvin feels some tension. He says, this is not to say that true experience is always easily dissected and understood. Because with all the vicissitudes of faith in our lives and all our different inmost emotions and affections, there can be numerous paradoxes. Calvin says one of those paradoxes is, 
when we're called to believe that God is still with us, when he, we feel that he has deserted us? Or, how can we believe God is favorably inclined to us when he strips us at times of all consciousness of that favor and seems to providentially postpone fulfilling his merciful promises? And Calvin makes this amazing statement, not once, but many times, in his commentaries, in his institutes. The believer can experience such apparent contradictions on a daily basis. Wow. That's saying something. A daily basis? Yes, says Calvin. He can feel forsaken of God even when deep down within he knows he's not. These conflicting experiences transpire within one heart and sometimes, says Calvin, like hope and fear, seem almost to cancel each other out. And what are we to do at such times? Well, if fear gets the upper hand, says Calvin, we ought to simply throw ourselves completely on the promises of God alone. Trust in those. And they'll give us courage to go on, in spite of temptations to doubt. Other times, when we have more feeling of communion with God, and we have faith to believe that God is working within us, and we do have more assurance, we simply respond in gratitude for that inward conviction and inward experience, and we just trust in the Lord, and we can get comfort from seeing His own work within us. But when you believe and throw yourself on the promises of God, when you can't feel or see anything within yourself, actually you exercise greater faith than ever, says Calvin. Because it's precisely this experience of faith in distraught times that enables believers to remain undisturbed when their entire world seems to be shaken, he writes. And you see, this is always going on in Calvin, isn't it? <laughs> Every morning he woke up at Geneva. He didn't, he didn't know what the day was going to bring, really. I mean, his world was shaken, turned upside down hundreds of times. Kicked out, brought back in, always in a swirl of activity. So he's speaking from personal experience here. He's learned in his own life, outside of him, his own experience within him. Everything gets shaken. But it's through this subjective and objective resting in the truths of God, the promise of God, that we find stability. Now, that leads us to look at his interfacing then of experience and assurance of faith. But I'll, yeah, I'll take questions right now. That's good. No problem. Because when I hear these things like this, you use the term paradox, it's almost like that type of experience is taking place where there's this disconnect, so to speak, internally with the word in our experience. There's this dichotomy taking place where hope, fear, is that. So how is he really, I'm curious, is that naked experience yep. just for unbelievers or is that something that we as believers or how? You are wonderfully anticipating what I'm going to say next. Oh. So thank you, <laughs> thank you, because now I'm going to try to resolve this paradox with four, four solutions. Calvin gives us four solutions, so we'll just, we'll just go right on and answer your question. If I'm, when I finish the fourth one, if I haven't answered it fully, you, you come back at me, okay? So Calvin's doctrine of assurance of faith basically reaffirms the tenets of Luther and Swingley, but it also discloses emphases of his own. Um, Calvin says, faith is nearly, or never, I'm, so, I'm sorry, never merely assent, ascensus, but always involves both knowledge, cognitio, and trust, fiducia. So, knowledge, trust, and assent. Faith rests firmly upon God's word. Faith says amen to the scriptures. Therefore, assurance must always be in the word and flow out of the word. 
So that's consistent with the rest of his theology we've just seen. Faith must always be word-centered. Assurance must always be word-centered. Second, faith and assurance are also inseparable from Christ and the promise of Christ. All God's promises are yea and amen in Christ. Calvin makes a lot of that. And third, faith always involves something more than objectively believing the promise of God. The promise of God is essential, it's the foundation, but it also involves personal subjective assurance. So there you have three very important things in Calvin. The Word, Christ and His promises, and now the subjective sealing of that to the soul. Faith, therefore, says Calvin, is an assured knowledge of God's benevolence toward us, revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts. One of his most famous definitions of faith, taken from 3.2.16 of the Institutes. Indeed, says Calvin, here is the hinge on which faith turns, that we do not regard the promises of mercy that God offers as true only outside of ourselves, but not at all in us. Rather, that we make them ours by inwardly embracing them, which of course is the act of faith, by inwardly embracing them. And so Calvin speaks of faith in all kinds of very solid ways. Um, I won't give you all the Latin expressions, I'll just give it to you in English. Certainty speaks of faith as a firm conviction, assurance, firm assurance, even full assurance. Also in his commentaries, not just his institutes, Calvin stresses that assurance is integral to faith. When he expounds 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, which I just read for you, he states that those who doubt their union with Christ are reprobates. He makes a strong statement. Paul declares that all are reprobates who doubt whether they profess Christ and are part of his body. Let us therefore reckon that alone to be right faith, which leads us to repose and safety in the favor of God with no wavering opinion, but with a firm and a steadfast assurance. So now you've got a very strong statement. Faith and assurance seem to be inseparable. That's the ideal. That's the way it ought to be. But now, and a lot of scholars don't go any further than that, and so they try to put a cleavage between Calvin and the Puritans. They say, see, Puritans made a distinction between faith and assurance. Calvin didn't, but their judgment is premature. Because throughout this lofty exposition of the doctrine of faith, Calvin repeats many other themes. Unbelief dies hard, he says. Assurance is often contested by doubt. There are se severe temptations, wrestlings, strife. These things are normative. Satan in the flesh assault faith. Trusting God is hedged about with fear. These are all themes often repeated by Calvin. And then this one, which will raise your eyebrows because you'll say, well, that seems to contradict what he just said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Unbelief is in all men always mixed with faith. For unbelief is so deeply rooted in our hearts, we're so inclined to it that not without hard struggle is each one able to persuade himself of what all believers confess with the mouth, namely, that God is faithful. Especially when it comes to reality itself, every man's wavering uncovers his hidden weaknesses. Since the battle, the struggle. And then in expounding John 20 verse 3, Calvin seems to contradict his assertion that true believers know themselves to be such when he testifies that the disciples had faith without awareness of it as they approached the empty tomb. He says, there being so little faith, or rather almost no faith, both in the disciples and in the women, it is astonishing that they had so great zeal. And indeed, it is not possible that religious feelings led them to seek Christ. Some seed of faith, therefore, remained in their hearts, but quenched for a time, so that they were not aware of having what they had. Thus the Spirit of God often works in the elect in a secret manner. 
So now I've left you thoroughly confused, or Calvin has, and you need to ask, how is it possible that faith is characterized by full assurance, and yet, Calvin says, we still allow for faith lacking assurance. It seems antithetical, these two statements. Assurance is free from doubt, yet not free. Does not hesitate, yet can hesitate. Contains security, but it's beset with anxiety. How do you resolve it? Calvin gives you four solutions, four helps at least, or principles. Number one, Calvin says you need to distinguish between the definition of faith and the reality of the believer's experience. Definition of faith and the reality of your experience. After he says in the Institutes that faith uh, involves great assurance, he then says this, Still, someone will say, believers experience something far different. In recognizing the grace of God toward themselves, they are not only tried by disquiet, which often comes upon them, but they are repeatedly shaken by gravest terrors. For so violent are the temptations that trouble their minds as not to seem quite compatible with that certainty of faith. Accordingly, this is still Calvin, we shall have to solve this difficulty if we wish the above-stated doctrine of faith to stand. And then here it comes. Surely, while we teach that faith ought to be certain and assured, we cannot imagine any certainty that is not tinged with doubt or any assurance that is not assailed. See, what Calvin is saying is when you define something and what it is in its essence, you define it in its ideal. But in actual experiential reality, you have to deal not just with the ought to of faith, but you have to do with the, deal with the is of faith, the struggles of faith in daily life. And so he goes on to say, my definition is how believers ought habitually and properly to think of faith. Faith should always aim at full assurance, even if it cannot reach that point in its experience. So, bare experience, nuda experientia, is not Calvin's goal, but experience grounded in the word because that gives more assurance. And that's true faith. But they, even that experience is contested in the soul. So, in Calvin's mind, when he reads the Psalms, he sees a lot of language about the ought to of faith. Especially at the end of the Psalms, when, 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 when the, the believer feels delivered and he just ends, revels in the promises and attributes of God. But there's also the is dimension of faith, the struggles in the Psalms. At the same time, it, Calvin says, they, happen at, they can happen at the same time. There's a battle. Which leads to the second principle. Principle of flesh versus spirit. Listen to Calvin again. It's necessary to return to that division of flesh and spirit, which we've mentioned elsewhere. It most clearly reveals itself at this point. Therefore, the godly heart feels in itself a division which is partly imbued with sweetness from its recognition of the divine goodness and partly grieves in bitterness from the awareness of its calamity. Partly, I say, rests upon the promise of the gospel, and partly trembles at the evidence of its own iniquity. Partly rejoices at the expectation of life, while partly shuddering at death. This variation arises from imperfection of faith. Interesting phrase, imperfection of faith. Since in the course of the present life, it never goes so well with us that we are wholly cured of the disease of unbelief and entirely filled and possessed by faith. <coughs> Hence arise those conflicts when unbelief, which reposes in the remains of the flesh, rises up to attack the faith that has been inwardly conceived. So Calvin sets the consolation of the spirit side by side with the imperfection of the flesh. For these are what the believer finds within himself. It's the struggle of Romans 7. O wretched man that I am. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, with the flesh, the law of sin. So the 
Christian perpetually struggles in this life. The Spirit fills him with delight in recognizing divine goodness, even as his flesh activates his natural proneness to unbelief. So Calvin writes, Our present state in our struggles of faith is far, far short of the glory of God's children, what it ought to be. Physically, we are dust and shadow, he writes, and death is always before our eyes. We're exposed to a thousand miseries so that we find always a hell within us. Wow, that's a strong statement. A hell within us. While still in the flesh, the believer may be tempted to doubt the whole gospel. But even as he's tormented with these fleshly doubts, the, spirit, the believer's spirit trusts God's mercy. It invokes him in prayer. It rests upon him through the word and through the sacraments. And by these means, faith gains the upper hand over unbelief. And then Calvin paints a very beautiful picture. He said it's like a palm tree growing. And it presses itself up in growth against all obstacles. So faith ultimately triumphs over those difficulties which besiege and imperil it. For faith is like a palm tree that strives against every burden and raises itself upward. So here you have it. Spirit versus flesh. From the spirit, you get hope and joy and assurance. From the flesh, fear, doubt, disillusionment. Now thirdly, Despite the tensions between definition and experience, between spirit and flesh, number one and number two, Calvin says that faith and assurance are not so mixed with unbelief that the believer is left with probability rather than certainty. And he goes on to argue that the smallest germ of faith, truth-saving faith, has assurance embedded in it because faith itself cannot doubt. It's your flesh that makes it doubt, makes you doubt. And so Calvin says, there's a note of victory lying in the very seat of faith because the root of faith, here, this is Calvin, can never be torn from the godly breast but clings so fast to the inmost parts that however faith seems to be shaken or to bend this way or that, its light is never so extinguished or snuffed out that it does not at least lurk, as it were, beneath the ashes. Now that's a powerful picture. When you are so cast down, so discouraged. You feel like you can hardly go on, you can hardly pray. You feel like your faith is down to zero. You feel like it's just, your spiritual life feels like a bunch of ashes and the fire is gone out and the zeal is gone. Calvin says, if you're a true believer, even beneath the ashes, there's still, there's still some fire. You just can't see it right now. But faith, the seed of faith is still in you. And that seed of faith can't doubt. That's why you don't go out and commit suicide. That's why you don't despair completely. So Calvin then speaks about weak assurance in terms of weak faith and other similar expressions. But faith itself is always victorious. And then finally and fourthly, there is a sweeping principle Calvin calls a Trinitarian framework for the doctrine of faith and assurance. And what he's doing, he's saying, in the midst of all of this, the Holy Spirit is at work, taking the things of the Father and of the Son and revealing them to you, so that you get assurance strengthened from election and from the pneumatological work of the Holy Spirit in your soul. But I'm going to have to develop that last principle because I'm, I was hoping I could do this all today, but I can't. We're out of time. Any final questions? We'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this tomorrow, finish it off, wrap it up, and then we'll ask for more questions. Yeah. Does he deal with the, uh, the influence of the devil in these matters? He does at times, yeah. Not as much as you might think. It's, he talks more about the struggles that you have within yourself as you come up against many enemies and pressures from without and sinful inclinations from within. It's more the inner holy war. Uh, he's not the kind of guy that says the devil made me do it. And, but the devil's there. And the devil encourages doubt. 
But you don't, there are others, there are other Puritans that speak more about the devil, much more about the devil than Calvin does. All right, who's turned to pray? We'll pick up on this tomorrow, and then uh, we'll ask for more questions, too, when, when we get, uh, get it wrapped up, because I think you may have some questions at the end. Go in the back row. Aaron? Gracious Lord, we do thank you for our study today on John Calvin. And may we stand at his shoulders, Father, and learn as he expresses what experiential faith looks like. We're grateful for the seminary and professors that teach us. We pray, Father, that we will grow not just in word but in application as we seek to minister to your church in Jesus' name. Amen.